there and welcome to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week's episode of the program, we will be discussing about the issue of unemployment and underemployment in Nigeria. We also have interesting news stories for you. We will be right back. It all started as a peaceful protest but turned violent a few minutes later. Members of the National Union of Food, Beverages and Tobacco Employees are out on the streets to protest against what they say is unfair labor practice in A&P Food Limited. We want to say no to casualization. We want to say no to slavery. This is a modern day slavery of the workers in this company. How many hours a day are they supposed to work? How many hours are they working? They are driving them like slaves in this country. And then how much are they paying them? What are the allowances? Are they, giving, are they being given the allowances? They are not. This is what we are talking about. There should be decent work environment. And then there should be decent work uh, allowances. Union leaders tried for harvest to enter the company. They say the picketing will continue until the management issue appointment letters to more than 2,000 casual workers. There are so many workers there. Some of them more than 10 years, 6 years as casuals. And they are, some of them are very qualified. They bring in new people, they employ them, give them fast, fast salary. We say this is not fair. If you must stop, you must be just. Give everybody equal opportunity. In the process, with, with the employers' association intervened, pleaded that we should settle it amicably, which we are very we wrote to them, they gave us this for the meeting. On no to us, they directed us to the other office. No no to us that they have a higher talks, good norms. As soon as we are entering the gate, they started attacking us. Okay. I met with Omotayo Olakunle, a machine operator who tells me he has been a contract staff for 10 years and wants the management to regularize his employment. I've been here since 2008. It's January 8, 2008. I've been company, and uh, this company is not treating us well. Because when they are paying the salary, they are paying us 20, 25,000 every month. And they are bringing people from from outside, which is all level. They are giving them 250,000 naira. They are bringing them to us, for us to train them. And I give them better money. But we that are here so long time, they are not do us well. They are treat us like a slave, which is not good. These are retirees of the Nigeria Police Force who left active service between 2017 and 2018. They are displaced with the Nigeria Police Pensions Limited and PENCOM and they want their gratuity reviewed. The Nigerian police pension grossly, grossly underpaid the retired officer and hence we are not happy the way they are paying us because we believe that the police pension just feel like paying us anything they feel like because how can a retired officer who have served the country for 35 years been paid gratuity 2.2 million, 2.3 million after 35 years of service. So this situation is not going down well with us, the retired officer. After serving 35 years, someone of level 6, level 8, level 9, level 10, level 11, they are paying us 2 million, 1.2, 1.3, 1.5, 1.9. It is a shameful thing. Please, we want our government to come to our aid. Law doesn't work retrogressively. This law was enacted 2004. I shouldn't know why it should, we shouldn't know why it should affect those who have worked for many years ago. It should start from 2004 for those who entered that time. Other pensioners who served in the police force for 35 years also spoke on how they are fed since retirement. Consider what we went through the police for 35 good years, in the day, in the night, in the sunshine, in the rain. We want them to come to our aid to pay us our due money. The money they are offering is nothing to write home about. The sister agencies we know, I may not mention them, a warrant officer goes home with about 11 million 
after retirement, an equivalent in police is going home to 1.4 million. It's, un it's unbelievable. And that is a reality which people can go there and find out. Now, coming again, uh, we are saying that uh, we that entered the 80s should be part of this pension something. Because the law that was made in 2004, when we were enlisted 80s, we should be part of that law. The retired police officers have received quit notice to vacate the barracks. Many of them complain that they are yet to receive their gratuities, neither have they started receiving their monthly pensions. They want the federal government, the inspector general of police, and other relevant stakeholders to come to their aid. One of the most pressing issues affecting the world currently is the high rate of unemployment and underemployment. In Nigeria, experts are of the view that this social economic problem needs radical and immediate solution before it consumes the peace of the country. They say, due to the economic structure and demography and dysfunctional education system, the country faces grave dangers as the result of unemployment. Many social commentators believe that authorities in the country underplay the depth of the problem of unemployment and underemployment. According to statistics, as at the third quarter of 2018, the unemployment rate was 23.1%, while that of underemployed stood at 20%, leading to a combined rate of 43.3%. This represents a 4.3% increase in the unemployment rate, but a 1.1% decline for underemployment. The director of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, Timothy Olawale, reacted to the development. We commend government's efforts at creating employment, but we are stressing for the opt-in time that the issue of focus on white collar job is not the way to go, it's not the solution. And we keep saying that from research and study out there, there are jobs and there are vacant positions, especially in many untapped and underdeveloped area. However, we do not have manpower that has the requisite skill to fill these particular positions or gaps that are in the labor market. Recently, former Minister of Labor and Employment Chris Igige predicted that Nigeria's unemployment rate will reach the 3.5% by 2020. The president of the National Union of Chemical, Footwear, Rubber, Leather and Non-Metallic Product Employees is of the view that the high prevalence of crimes including murder, insurgency, militancy, armed robbery, kidnappings and drug abuse are some of the effects of unemployment. Because there's no security in Nigeria. Almost every day you hear that uh, they kidnap the, from here, west, north, and east. It's not only in the north. Even in the Kiti, they do kidnap. There are a lot of kidnapping going on over there. So because of uh, and what is the cause of all this thing uh, is economy. Because everybody wants to eat. They want to look for what they will eat. So these are the problems we have been facing. And we will now uh, appeal to the federal government that uh, the goods that we can produce in Nigeria, they should not allow anybody to import it. Some of the measures needed to address these can be achieved by a change in mindset, diversification of the economic base, infrastructure development, education reform, investment in agriculture and agro-based industries, as well as reformation of the informal sector. With the recent statements by the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria that the country's failure to tackle high rates of unemployment may lead to another recession soon, it is hoped that the relevant agencies will act swiftly to tackle the issues. On the profile interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the General Secretary of Nupeng, Comrade Afolabi Olawale. He tells me there are possible solutions to the issue of unemployment and underemployment in Nigeria. Take a listen. <music> 
It's good to have you on the program. Thank you, Ma. A lot is happening in Nigeria right now in the workplace, and um, for now we're interested in the rate of unemployment in the country. Now, according to the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, it states that um, we still have more than 2 million people that will actually lose their job before the year runs out. What do you think about this prediction? What can be done to actually ensure that this doesn't manifest in the country? Actually, what I thought about this prediction is simply that it's scary. It's unfortunate. It's really disturbing. Uh, it, uh, we have come a long way to get to this situation. We have lost, lost so much ground to get to this situation. And it will be difficult to say categorically that we are going to avert the situation within the context of the situation we are in right now. The economy is contracting. There is high level of insecurity. Investors are being discouraged. I, it's difficult to avert. What do you think can be done in terms of um, ensuring that proper policies are put in place to ensure that um, probably the economy grows? Yeah, first of all, we have to believe in ourselves. Before talking about policies, we have to believe in ourselves. We government have to work towards ensuring that there's adequate security. Because nobody will invest in an insecure environment. People keep losing jobs as long as there is increase in violent crimes, increase in fraudulent crimes, and increase in intertribal conflicts. And this Boko Haram menace, Esme menace. So how do you invest? A friend of mine invested in agriculture in uh, River State, a Lele area. Large expanse of palm fruit plantation. One, over the year, they kept on going there, ransacking the place, stealing the chicken, killing the people there. So the man practically had to run out of the place. So if we are saying we are going to agriculture, where are we going to have agricultural plantation? Is it not in these interior places? where people are not more secured. I listened to the CBN governor talking about increasing the productive engagement through agriculture. But the question is, who are going to do the farming? There is population explosion in the urban area because there is a high level of migration in the last three years. High level of migration to major cities. Because look at Benue, look at Bauchi, now in Katsina, first thing we must do is to address the insecurity in the land. Okay, now many employers of labor have actually made several comments as regards um, probably the employability of an average graduate in Nigeria. Now, the question is, what happens to diversi diversification? What happens to probably skill acquisition? We know that um, the, not everybody can be in the office. What do you think, as probably a unionist, can be done to ensure that um, probably um, people that have skills can be incorporated into the system? Yeah. The foundation I laid is about security. The next phase after security is about how employable are Nigerians. How employable are Nigerians? not only in terms of the competence or the skill, but in terms of attitude to work, in terms of their integrity. I have engaged so many employers. The problem we have, Nigerian employers have with Nigerian workers, is not that they lack skill or competence per se, it's one about attitude. Uh, Nigerians have to wake up, young graduates, school students, we have to go back there. I'm a trade union leader. I fight for workers. But at the same time, I'm worried about the rate of unemployment. I'm worried about the rate of business closure. As I'm speaking for workers, I also have to look at the employment area. Because the more workers, the more workers we have, the more members I get. So that brings me to the issue of even unions actually complaining of um, low turnout of members across board. 
How worrisome is this? Is there anything Labour is actually doing to ensure that we have more workers engaged? Actually, in terms of union membership, many employers are cooperating in terms of anti-Labour activities, especially in the oil and gas industry. Uh, because of the large pool of labor, employers are also exploiting, giving precarious employment, indecent employment. And when you talk about precarious em employment, we are talking in terms of work that are not stable, work that are not secure, work where the workers' rights are not protected. And when we talk about rights, we are talking about, first of all, union rights. Because it's when workers have unions, when they can freely associate, that they can collectively engage the management in terms of improving their working condition. But in a situation where they are not allowed to come together, management employers easily find a way to get rid of them, easily find a way to give them any kind of condition. And it's in the Nigeria now where we have a large pool of unemployed people, People that are desperately looking for work, anything they offer them, they take. And looking at underemployment in the country, most workers that are even employed are actually reported to be underemployed. Yeah. What's the way forward? The way forward is to expand the economy. The way forward is that all of us cannot be in a white collar, blue collar job. We should find a way to expand the productive engagement in terms of other means, rather than looking for monthly paid employment. If, we incre if there is adequate security, definitely investors will come. That's my premise. If there is security, if there is adequate infrastructure development, like power, most especially. After security, I go for power. Then I go for education. If we have good security, we have power, we have education. On the basis of security, people can be at peace, they can be creative. On the basis of power, they can actually try to practice what they have. Go for small scale industry, produce a little thing to sell, and through that there will be empowerment. Then finally education. Our policy must focus towards education that we keep people with skill rather than just certificates. Individuals should be able to come out of school and think, be creative of what he can do for himself, rather than waiting for government or rather than waiting for government employment. You spoke about education, you spoke about power, you spoke about security. Now that we have, um, according to research, we have 30% um, 30, 30 of Nigerian um, workers um, unemployed. That means we have 16 million people that are unemployed right now as we speak. The federal government has the NPAR program. Do you think the NPAR program has actually done justice to actually cater for those that are actually unemployed at the moment? If you consider the, compare the intervention the federal government is making to the pool of young men and women out there, you will realize that NPAR is just like a drop in the ocean. Nigerian population is about 208 million people and still counting. And what's our GDP? 115 point something billion dollars compared to other. We are number seven in the whole world in terms of population. And our population is exploding every day. So empower is just a drop in the ocean. We need to focus on other productive engagement. But I will re-emphasize again, security is key. If you want your people to be employed, you must provide security for the investor, for his investment. He must be sure that when he is investing in a particular environment, he is safe, his family is safe, his equipment is safe. Money goes where it will be comfortable. Money goes where it's welcome. Money goes where it's pampered. But here, the messages, the sights and stories that are going across the world is gory. It's terrible. And so most of the investment we support, even ourselves as individuals in this country, take for instance, somebody that wants to invest in anything, 
that require power. As you are building your factory, you are thinking of electricity. Somebody that invests about 1 billion naira to build a factory must think of not less than 100 million naira for powers alone. And that's not, that's just initial investment, 100 million for generator, for backup, and for regular consumption of diesel. It's, it doesn't worth it. Many investors don't come down here because what you will spend is almost 100% higher than what you will spend to invest in similar venture in other clients. So how can you change the narrative? We can change narrative, first of all, by ensuring that there is adequate security for lives and properties. There must be adequate security for lives and properties. It is then, and our narrative outside should become positive, that go to Nigeria, Nigeria is safe. It's a safe place to invest. That's rebranding. Yeah, it works. So, first, but you cannot rebrand on lies. There must be actual security on ground. But on television every day, in newspaper every day, you hear about rape, raping, you hear about fraudulent practices, number of people jailed for, for 419, number, the amount of money being embezzled, the difficulties in uh, registering your business and in starting businesses. It's, it's difficult. According to the Washington-based um, Brookings Institution, it says that um, Nigeria has taken over India as one of um, the poorest people or persons um, living in extreme poverty. Yeah. What do you have to say about this? I say go back to the issue of uh, security. Do you know the number of, number of men and women that have been displaced? If you are displaced from your environment, you leave your workplace. If that is farming, fishing, anything you are doing, you abandon your home. You are on the move. Your children, your wife, your entire family. Every time I think of war, I'm always afraid for this country. And I want every Nigerian to think deep about this. If there is crisis in any society, crisis in any society, and there is displacement, there can never be any productive venture. So it's not surprising that we have taken over in terms of the number of people living below poverty level. In that place, there will be no, no school, no medical, no productive venture. And you see them moving in droves because they are, they are not secure in their homeland. And that's why we are, we are, we are where we are. Recently, the Central Bank of Nigeria raised an alarm that um, Nigerians should prepare for tough times. And we're also aware that the inflation rate has actually increased. How tough can it get? It's going to be tougher. I quite concur with the guy. It's going to be very, very tough. Because as long as you are not producing and you are alive, you must consume. And people become desperate. Survivor of the fittest becomes the order of the day. I, I wish the government can quickly, comprehensively address the issue of security. Because it will get to a point, God forbid, it may get to a point where people will be entering, marauders will be entering homes looking for food. Because if people are displaced from their local place, and they have for days no food to eat, they'll be desperate. And so those that are migrating from the rural area to urban area, we in the urban area should not sleep. We must quickly, government must quickly intervene, do something. Secure places for people before you encourage them to go into agriculture. You want to farm, you are in your farm, they come one night, they wipe you away. These are the challenges. To address it, sincerely speaking, we need adequate security. Now moving forward, looking at... Um trade unionism generally. How do you think that um, as a trade unionist, how do you think labor 
can contribute to um, employment in the country. Is there going to be any plan in terms of maybe mobilization, enlightenment, or probably engaging the federal government on things that has to be done, maybe in terms of policies, to ensure that um, we have more young persons in the workplace? Yeah. Trade union generally, uh, the, the direction, the focus of labor movement these days has actually changed. Because we've also looked inward, we realize that our membership has really gone down. And if care is not taken, there might be trade union extinction as well. Because without employ employment, there will be no trade union. So uh, each of the labor centers I'm aware have their economic team. They, they brainstorm and they've been engaging government. And uh, the new leadership, the current leadership now, they're not thinking in terms of just how much will come into the hands and the pockets of workers, especially from Nupin. We are thinking of how we could collaborate to ensure that our industry survives, that company enterprises don't die. We will do as much as possible to engage management, to uh, dialogue with them, and ensuring. Sometimes we uh, approve wage freeze, negotiation freeze, to, to ensure that businesses that have been threatened, they survive. But beyond that, beyond that, I will still go back to job security. Labor cannot provide it. It's government that should provide it. And sincerely speaking, no investor will come to do it. It was an interesting conversation I had with you. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching, and remember, labor creates wealth.